Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us today for what should be quite an insightful webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Tipple, and I work in the Scottish Home Renewables team here at the Energy Saving Trust. So over the past few years, we've been delivering webinars covering different aspects of renewables and the domestic energy sector. So this is an area of work that's funded by the Scottish Government as part of their support for home renewables and energy efficiency, which is there to help them meet um, climate change targets, help Scottish householders lower their energy bills and build a lower carbon economy. So this year we wanted to do things a bit differently by focusing on what is not only the main driver of change across the energy sector just now, but also an issue that is becoming increasingly more mainstream, I guess, due to the challenges and risks it represents. So challenges which are increasingly more likely to disrupt the balance of the natural world and at levels we've kind of never witnessed before. So over the coming weeks, we'll be delivering a series of three webinars addressing the topic of climate change. Uh, today's webinar is the first in the series, which will act as an introduction to climate change, focusing on explaining what the greenhouse effect is and how activities in the different energy sectors are contributing to the problem. So the second webinar will follow on from this by highlighting some of the solutions to the problem, focusing on what actions individuals can take to reduce their carbon footprint and living more sustainably. So we'll then finish off the series with a third and final webinar, which will it'll act as a kind of real world case study, demonstrating one person's approach to creating and living a more sustainable, you know, low carbon life. So just before we start, I uh, just wanted to cover some general housekeeping points uh, about our webinars. So you'll hear us, but we can't hear you. This is perfectly normal for webinars, but uh, you have no worry, uh, reason to worry about kind of background noise or anything there. Um, on your screen now, you should see the webinar control panel. Here you can type any questions you have or inform us of any issues you're experiencing uh, with sound, etc. Uh, other listeners won't be able to see what you've typed, but we'll be monitoring comments throughout the webinar and we'll address questions at the end. Um, and finally, this webinar is scheduled to last approximately 60 minutes and we'll be recording the session. So if you're unable to watch the whole webinar, then you can always watch sections back later. Okay, so let's have a look at the agenda for the day. Uh, first, we'll cover what is, uh, well, what the term enhanced greenhouse effect is, what greenhouse gases are and where they come from. We'll then review some of the observations that form I guess, the foundation for our scientific understanding. Uh, that will lead us on nicely to look at the international response, what has been so far and what the possible outlooks for the future are. Um, I guess another way of looking at the agenda is what is climate change, what's causing it, what evidence is there and what are we doing and is it enough? So and then we'll just final finalise the webinar with a short Q&A session. So do remember, if you have any questions, you can type them through the control panel. So you'll be glad to discover that I'll not be presenting this whole webinar, so you don't need to listen to my monotonous drawl for the whole hour. Um, we're actually lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Stephen Peake today, which is a real privilege for us. Um, Stephen's currently a senior lecturer in environmental technology at the Open University. He's got a strong physics background, engineering background, and a wealth of kind of research experience with organisations including the Royal Institute for International Affairs and the International Energy Agency. Uh, Stephen's also established author and editor of several textbooks covering the topic of renewable energy and sustainability. He's a fellow of the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge and a senior associate of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. So it's safe to say that Stephen is well informed and is well placed to present this topic today. Um, also, if you're interested in what Stephen has to say today and you want to hear more, then he's actually delivering a TEDx talk this Friday on six steps to system change, not to climate change, uh, which you'll be able to access through the web page that's at the bottom of the screen there. Now, 
enough of me telling you about Stephen and what he's going to present today. Uh, best if I just hand you over and we get started. So uh, if you just bear with me a second, I'll hand over the reins to Stephen. So good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, and I'm delighted to spend um, <clears throat> part of this lunchtime speaking to you about about climate change. And as Scott said, in his kind introduction, we're going to start with the greenhouse effect. And it's sometimes called the enhanced greenhouse effect. And so we can just go over that to begin with. So here's a picture of the Earth from space, the blue marble against the black background. So what actually happens then uh, when sunlight um, enters the Earth's atmosphere, it can, as we know, uh, penetrate the atmosphere and reach us at ground level, not on a day like today here in Milton Keynes, there's definitely very little, um, very little uh, sunshine uh, arriving at the surface, but um, of course it is, and um, it's absorbed as heat at the surface. Some of it's absorbed actually in the layer, the thin layer of atmosphere on its way down. Um, and it's um, it, it's it's given off um, in, in longer wavelengths in the infrared region. So the Earth, if it just continued to um, accept the Earth's um, sunshine energy, um, it would just heat up. But of course it doesn't heat up. It gives off some of that heat back to space. It radiates it back to space at a longer wavelength. Um, but on its way out, as it leaks this energy back, um, some of it is caught again by the blanket of air, the thin layer of air that surrounds us, the atmosphere. And it bounces around a few times, and so it just delays its eventual escape back to space. And this is what is responsible um, for, um, for keeping our Earth um, 33 degrees warmer centigrade than it would be if we didn't have an atmosphere. So our atmosphere, which consists of lots of different gases, um, has this ability to warm the Earth 33 degrees uh, greater than it would be if it wasn't there. Uh, and one of these, um, there are several greenhouse gases, and I'm going to come on to those next to show a bit more of the science of how that happens. Um, the next slide, I've got a little uh, animation. I hope that works just just to just reinforce what I've just said. So here comes the sunlight. Some of it's bounced back into space. Some of it's reabsorbed and re-radiated its heat. And that's the that's the greenhouse effect. And uh, we should love the greenhouse effect um, because as uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, we've been here about 220,000 years, and we've never known anything other than uh, this lovely uh, plus 33 degrees than it would have been otherwise. And lots of other plant and animal species have come adapted to it. So um, there's nothing at all wrong with the greenhouse effect. It's a lovely thing. And uh, we owe our pattern of life as it currently exists uh, to that atmosphere and its greenhouse effect. So I said that there were various um, gases which um, which cause this greenhouse effect. And you've, you've probably heard of carbon dioxide and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But in fact, the, one of the main um, uh, gases that's responsible for keeping us slightly warmer is water vapor. And the light green bar there is, shows that clouds actually are responsible for trapping some heat. And then we have the red bar, uh, carbon dioxide, and then some other gases, uh, again, which I'll come to in a second, which are in the orange bar on the right hand side. Um, and it's very complicated, this, actually. Um, basically, small changes in the composition of the atmosphere, just tiny, tiny changes in the amount of carbon dioxide um, or the other uh, greenhouse gases, which we call forcing greenhouse gases, tiny changes in those can have a big effect on uh, the other indirect warming effects, such as the amount of clouds, the type of clouds, the amount of water vapor. So it's a very, very complicated bit of physics, this bit of Earth system science. But all we have to know is that despite there being less than half a percent of CO2 by volume in the atmosphere, if we muck around with that, uh, that fraction, uh, even just a small amount, it can have massive effects 
on temperature and the temperature has effects on water vapor and the water vapor has effects on clouds and the whole thing affects everything affects everything and it gets very very difficult and uh, difficult to model and, um, and interesting very quickly so <clears throat> the enhanced greenhouse effect is uh, a label which describes uh, the effect that humans are having on our climate because we're changing the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases um, beyond what they would naturally fluctuate um, in the absence of, of uh, 8 billion people and their technologies and the, the things that they use. So if we look at the uh, molecular structure of some of these greenhouse gases, we've got four here, water, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. Um, each of them have different molecular geometries, but what's common to all of them is that they can get excited when they encounter infrared radiation at certain wavelengths. And the way they, they all get excited at slightly different wavelengths, but if you get the, if they come into contact with the infrared at the particular wavelength that they like, they will start to jiggle and vibrate and they will start to do some very strange things. Um, and basically that's the trapping mechanism. That's the stretching of these bands and the, the sort of dancing of these individual molecules in response to this infrared radiation as it's escaping, as it's attempting to escape into space. So really it's down to the geometries of these molecules and they each have different geometries and they each have different absorption and re-emission spectrums. Um, and that's, that is what the enhanced greenhouse effect is at the molecular level. So if we just look at one of those uh, greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, um, the usual main culprit, but it's not the only one. And we look at the history of global emissions of carbon dioxide going back to 1960 up to the present day. And this is a graphic which is showing total global emissions uh, in billion tons of CO2, gigatons of CO2. Uh, and you can see that we begin in 1959, just below 10, maybe that's about 9 billion tons. And then, um, as the world develops and the economy develops and the global population of people goes from three to four to five to six to just under eight as it is today, we treble and a half our global CO2 emissions. And this is from fossil fuels. And it's further subdivided to give you an idea of which, where these, where these emissions are coming from. And if we look, for example, at the large grey area at the bottom of this graph, the rest of the world, so that, that which is not Europe, US, India or China, we can see that there's been fairly substantial growth there, actually. Um, China is grown in particularly very fast. That's the red region at the top. India growing fast, but not nowhere near the same size as China yet. And the US has grown moderately. Um, and the EU has in fact grown in the middle fattened and uh, is shrinking slightly um, now. It's not, it's, not, it's not at all uh, growing quickly at the moment. If, if anything, it's just, it's, just, uh, it's just tipping down a bit. So the growth in our emissions from fossil fuels is actually um, from two main regions. It's from China and the rest of the world, which is not India, the US and Europe. If we look at, um, if we look at that same data again, um, but we add in the uh, other greenhouse gases um, and we can kind of add them all together because we've got, we've got global warming potentials. We know that so much, so many, uh, a ton of um, methane is about 25 tons worth of CO2 in terms of its potential to warm the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. We've got, we've got, we can just translate one ton of one gas into the CO2 equivalent. And that's what we have here. We have greenhouse gas emissions plotted in CO2 equivalent per year for different gases. And we can see that carbon dioxide is uh, uh, that region at the bottom in yellow or ochre or orange. Um, is by far and away the largest proportion 
of anthropogenic man-made greenhouse gases but it's you know it's about two-thirds um we've got um some co2 which is caused the red is, is co2 but that's caused not from fossil fuels that's from changes in land use that's when we farm or do till farming and release carbon from the soils of the forests um, and that's associated with our farming and land use change um, then we've got methane emissions which are coming uh, from uh, the natural gas industry they're coming from um, um, ruminants um, the agricultural uh, sector and they are in the light blue the dark blue is nitrous oxide coming largely from agriculture and then some exotic powerful called F gases some industrial gases at the top in dark blue uh, responsible for about two percent um, and they're to do with all kinds of medical and electronic and manufacturing applications um, so there you go co2 uh, from energy is one part of the story and CO2 altogether from energy and land use change is only one part of the story because there is methane, there is agriculture to think about and some some of the industrial gases. So let me move on now to the second section of the talk which is about what changes in the climate have we actually measured and detected and um, this is important what I've just shown you just up to now is emissions and inventories and statistics about energy and gases that's great we can we can estimate we can measure this, but that, that's not quite the same as measuring uh, changes in the climate it's part of climate change but there are other more direct measures and one of the ways in which we understood how the release of all these gases have, has changed the world is by going to the North and South Pole and allowing our scientists to dig ice cores uh, through the ice to up to two miles deep. So get a core of ice up to two miles deep. In, and, and that ice is a bit like um, tree rings in that tree rings can capture something of the history of the, the tree as it stood on its spot and that ice core can also capture the history of snow as it was laid down on that ice sheet uh, tens hundreds of thousands of years earlier and you can have a smaller you can see at the bottom of this picture smaller uh, bands of ice um, some dense some with more air bubbles in them the lighter ones some showing winter some showing summer and the thaw some thicker than others showing when the precipitation has been higher some thinner um, and so that is our record that is a record of past uh, climate as you drill down through the ice and here they are doing it this is the sort of um, machine they use and how they will go through the ice and they drag up um, this is about it's about six centimeters across this ice core and they um, carefully pack these things up and um, send them um, they might do some processing on site in the Arctic or Antarctic but usually they're packed up and sent back to laboratories uh, in in the host country from where the scientists are being sponsored um, and this is a uh, Rob Mulvaney at the British Antarctic Survey fridge in Cambridge when I last visited and here he is holding one of those ice cores inside the freezer and you can see the machine at the back of him the blade saw for cutting up thin slices of this ice which can then be analyzed and because they know exactly where in the ice core it is they're slicing they know precisely how far back in time it is so you get a thin slice of ice like this and in it you can see it consists of bubbles and as you take it outside the freezer as I have done here with my hand um, you can hear those bubbles of air start to pop because actually that's come from deep in the ice core and it's under a lot of pressure so as they as they as the ice as, as the slice melts it starts to fizz and pop and what's happening there is the water melting in my hands uh, has a certain um, isotopic composition and the gases that are trapped in the uh, in the bubbles in the air that 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 they have a certain isotopic um, uh, composition um, so the different uh, different types of hydrogen different types of 
of um, in, in the water, different types of oxygen in the air that's trapped in the bubbles. And actually, by chemically analysing this, you can figure out from sniffing the air that's trapped and chemically analysing the water, you can figure out actually uh, what the temperature was and what the carbon dioxide concentrations were. Um, and so what ice cores allow us to do is to produce images such as this uh, famous one. This is the source of this is the is the US uh, NOAA organization. But here we have um, a an image showing the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and the implied temperature from the isotopic composition of the water. And this is going start the present day on the right hand side, and we can go backwards through one, two, three, three ice age cycles and one, two, three, four, five warm periods. So we're currently on the right hand side. We're not in an ice age, we're in a relatively warm phase of the Earth cycle. But if we went back just 15, 20,000 years, we would dip down into, if you look at the graph, it goes minus eight compared to where it is today, if we just go back 20,000 years. And then it took about, you have to go back about another 100,000 years before we reach the, the last interglacial, the last warm period. And the Earth seems to do this every 100, 110,000 years in recent times. But what we also notice is that there seems to be this correlation between the red line and the blue line that when the red line moves, the blue line moves, or when the blue line moves, the red line moves. At least that's what it looks like when you look at it quickly and just at a glance. What actually is happening, if you zoom in, is that the temperature shifts just before the carbon dioxide, but they are coupled. They are very, very closely coupled. This tells you that there is a close coupling between global temperature and global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Now this vertical line um, at the side, right at the right hand side, this, this red vertical line is just, it's vertical. It, that's, the, that's the increase, the recent increase in um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions that we've, that we've experienced uh, as we've come out of the ice age. It's sort of stabilized at three, 350 parts per million in what we call, I suppose, the, the pre-industrial concentration. Um, and since then, uh, since we've been, since say 1750, if we take that as the beginning of the industrial revolution and the burning of coal and the release of lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, um, we are now at a, a global uh, CO2 concentration of 409 parts per million. Um, and that's going up at about two to three parts per million per year. Um, and so the peak concentration, according to the last four or five ice age cycles for CO2, would be about 280, 300 parts per million. But we've gone over that by 109 parts per million. And so does, is that a lot? Is, is, is three, two or three parts per million a year, is that a big deal? Well. Let's just have a look. The difference here on this graphic between a interglacial, a warm age and an ice age, if you look at the left-hand side, if you look at the CO2 concentration, it's between 280 and say 180. The difference between an ice age, which is minus eight degrees cooler than the interglacial on average globally, is 100 ppm. Well. If we are changing through our burning of fossil fuels and land use clearers and other, other things that we do, if we are changing the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide at two to three parts per million per year, that's 20 to 30 in 10 years, that's 60 to 90 in 30 years. It's, we're changing the composition of the atmosphere in about 40 years, what it would take the planet to normally do at the end of an ice age, it would take it 20,000 years. So there you go, that's something to, to ponder. Uh, so if you meet somebody who says, well, climate change is natural, the Earth's very dynamic, it's been a very cold place, it's been a hot place, it changes all the time, all that's absolutely true. 
The question is about rates of change and the speed of change and whether or not that change is natural. Um, I, you know, it's been happening in the history without human uh, direct intervention or whether it's forced. Um, and clearly we are forcing the concentration of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you know, at a rate of 30 to 40 years, what the what would have occurred naturally in 15 to 20,000 years, so many times quicker. So this is what this is this is the evidence of the enhanced uh, greenhouse effect. This is the evidence associated uh, with the increase of of um, of carbon dioxide concentrations and so some people might say well that carbon dioxide might not have come from my car tailpipe it might not have come from the power station it could have come from volcanoes under the sea well in fact we do know when we measure we can measure very carefully uh, what the co2 concentration is today in the atmosphere and one of the longest running data sets is is, is um, known as the keeling curve from the Mauna Loa Observatory in the Pacific, and this has got a sniffy device on the top of um, on the top of um, a mountain, and it is uh, constantly sniffing the parts per million. And not only can it can it look at the the concentration, but it can look at the isotopic um, uh, fractional dif distribution of that uh, of that concentration, and it can discern that in fact. The additional carbon that it's registering is ancient carbon. It's carbon that was laid down uh, as coal, oil, and gas uh, 200 million years ago or so. And um, so there's a direct connection between what we measure in terms of additional carbon dioxide concentrations and where we think it's come from. It's not come from volcanoes under the sea. Um, so there we go. That's the carbon dioxide story. So this leads the IPCC. So we'll um, I'll review the just to explain a bit more of what the relationship is between that and other policy processes later. But for now, the IPCC is a well-respected intergovernmental body, and they look at all the evidence periodically, every five, six, seven years, and they try to make sense of it. And here they're saying that the atmospheric concentrations of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide are unprecedented in the last 800,000 years, uh, that these levels have increased. It's primarily due to fossil fuel emissions and some land use change. They're also saying actually that the oceans have been quite good at absorbing about 30% of that emitted CO2, but actually when CO2 dissolves in the ocean, it, it creates carbonic acid, and so it actually acidifies the ocean water slightly, and that's not particularly good if you're a coral reef. Or, or other um, species that are sensitive to that acid, those acid levels. So um, here's another famous uh, conclusion from the last time, the last IPCC assessment. Warming of the system is unequivocal. Um, the atmosphere and ocean have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have, have increased. In particular, if we look at you know, just how warmer the Earth is becoming, well, it's quite significant. Each of the last three decades, each of the last three decades on average has been warmer than any other preceding decade since 1850. Um, and there's a fair degree of confidence that that's true from, from our current historical data. And so here is a graphic showing that increase um, in the global in the average of global land and ocean surface temperatures between 1850 and 2012 um, and the what's plotted here on the right on the left hand side is the is the change relative to the average as it was in the period 1961 to 1990 so you can see that um, uh, it there's this there's this definite trend but in particular from 1960, 1970 onwards, you've got some interannual or you know five yearly cycles going on, but overall the average, uh, in the average, um, inc there's there is a very definite, marked, steady increase in uh, long-term average annual combined land and ocean surface temperature. Um, 
if you one of the things that happens when we talk about um, the climate changing by one, two, three, four, five degrees, their average, their global averages, um, and that's a pretty the idea of a global average temperature is itself a bit a bit strange because um, at any single time on the planet, some places are at plus 50 degrees centigrade, some places are at minus 50 degrees centigrade, so that's a 100 degrees centigrade difference. Some places are in night, some places are in day, and there are all kinds of temperatures at any one time over the surface of the planet. Those temperatures are slightly warmer, warmer over the land, they're cooler over the oceans. And so what's actually happening is that the Earth is warming uh, not at a steady, consistent rate all over, but it's it's warming in strange ways, in strange in strange places. So here is a graphic showing us that the temperature increase um, is actually greatest over land masses in the northern latitudes, a little bit in South America, but um, and a little bit in uh, West West Africa, Central Sahara. Um, but actually, there are there are places here which where there's been uh, there's been some relative, re relatively little cooling, but there's places where you've had two and a half uh, degrees of cooling in the period, you know, roughly a century between 1901 and 2012. So climate change doesn't affect us uniformly. It's lumpy, it's bumpy, and um, it will continue to be that way. And that means when we talk about limiting global heating to two degrees that's an average what we really mean is we want to uh, you know it, it might mean four or six degrees in northern russia or northern canada um and so if we say you know currently we're heading for three or four degrees of warming well that might be eight degrees in those northerly latitudes or southerly latitudes higher the higher latitudes um so yeah, what this means is that um, there are some stronger signals going on in Greenland and the Antarctic and we can definitely say, see some of those and the IPCC here is concluding that there has been loss of uh, ice glaciers and shrinking of glaciers worldwide. Um, the human influence on the climate system is clear. This is evidenced from the increasing greenhouse gas concentrations and you know, the trapping of of, of heat from these concentrations and then the consequent warming which I've shown you and all this is affecting affecting the system. So if I move now to the third part of the webinar which is um, our international policy response um, and what we think might happen in the future from our models and best guesses and estimates. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is uh, a an intergovernmental panel under the auspices of the UN. It's 1988 when it first starts to operate, so that kind of is a, a way of sort of formally dating the lifespan of this topic. It was it was it was it was being discussed a, about a decade earlier in the U, US Environmental Protection Agency in particular. But um, yeah, 1988 is the is the time we really got serious about this. It, it produces reports every five to seven years and we're due the sixth assessment report just, just coming up. Um, it's in, it, it does other special reports too and, and last year it produced a report on, the, on why we should try to limit global average um, temperature increases to 1.5 degrees as, as opposed to two degrees and showed the sort of there's quite a big difference just just that half a degree of average makes quite a big difference to lots of people places and systems um, other milestones in our kind of international response were the well the earth summit agreements which were signed in 1992 George Bush senior flew in at the last minute and actually did a very good job actually um, of uh, turning negotiations around and making sure that the three international conventions were born, the Rio agreements. They were the Biodiversity Convention, the Climate Change Convention, and the Desertification Convention. And that was a major landmark. And um, it took about five years for the Climate Change Convention to sort of uh, move on from its generic text and, and issue its first set of targets for the industrialized nations. And that was 
the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. Um, and by 2012, there'd been some progress from some industrial countries of beginning to limit our emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. But it wasn't enough. And for a good decade, um, well, for a good while the Kyoto Protocol implementation period was going on, uh, we were already arguing about, well, we need a slightly different system where perhaps um, developing countries, rapidly developing countries such as India and China can join in and reduce their emissions too. It's not just all about the wealthy OECD countries. And we reached a climax in 2015 with the Paris Agreement, which tried to get lots of different countries to make promises to implement their actions to keep global warming below two, well below two degrees. So for the first time, we kind of put a figure on it in 2015. We said, we don't really want to go beyond two degrees. And that, that you know, in the, in the original convention, it didn't say that article two of the goal of the original convention just said, we want, we want us all to be safe and well, well, that's fine, but we needed to put a number on it. That was the Paris Agreement. In the UK, um, we had a world leading climate change act, which is uh, was, was quite famous around the world in putting legally binding commitments for that and every successive government um, to um, reduce uh, UK emissions by 80% of all greenhouse gases by 2050 in all sectors. And recently that's been strengthened last year to to becoming net net zero. We want to have net zero emissions in the UK by 2050. So we strengthened that by 20%. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, actually, Scotland has gone one further and is going to attempt to achieve net zero uh, by 2045, uh, five years earlier. Um, the problem, the problem with 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 these, you know, setting a if you set a temperature target and say, well, that's that's as much warming as we want to bear. Well, essentially what you've done is set yourself a carbon budget because the way that the atmosphere and the oceans um, uh, and the forests absorb any carbon that you emit, they, they share it between each other. Some is left in the atmosphere, some gets absorbed by the ocean, some is absorbed by the plants, um, but basically, once you've set a temperature target, you've set yourself a total historic budget, which you have to stick to if you want to stick to that that target. And you can see on the right hand side, um, the two degree target um, is associated with about a thousand gigatons of CO2. Well, if, if you realize that we're globally emitting about 40, 45 gigatons of CO2 per year, it's 25 years worth of global emissions, um, and it, you know, and if and if we're emitting 45 CO, gigatons of CO2 a, a year and accelerating, as you saw at the beginning, that isn't 25 years. That might be 15 years. So this is where you get that those headlines which say we've only got 15 years left before we have um, uh, kissed goodbye to the two degree target. So setting a temperature goal is just the same really as setting up an overall CO2 budget and the CO2 budget is shrinking in terms of its number of years as long as the there is this constant increase in global emissions. So right now and despite all the talk um, the world is actually on track when you add up all the pledges and targets and the effect of the current policies etc we're on track for something like a, an increase in global mean surface temperature of three degrees C. Um, now doesn't mean to say that's where it's going to end up because we could uh, get even more aggressive in our climate policies and have some breakthroughs in technologies and a bit of luck. Um, but this this is the famous climate action tracker thermometer, which nicely shows at the bottom the pre-industrial is taken as the sort of the zero point. Um, we're at one degree of warming in 2018. The ideal kind of maximum from the Paris Agreement would be 1.5 degrees, but we're quite close to that. But if you go up the thermometer, we're, we're kind of heading heading in that three 
And if, you, if you're a bit of a pessimist, you, you, you can actually say that that middle darker blue bar, we're kind of heading for three or four degrees because you, you might not believe that all the, country, all the countries are actually going to deliver on their fancy promises and pledges that they made in Paris and, and, and since. So why, why does all this matter? Well, for every, um, for every, for every you know, fraction of a degree increase in global temperature, this is on the left-hand side here, um, there are a set of systems on the right-hand side which, which, which are disrupted as, as, the, as, the, as the global temperature increase uh, gets bigger. Um, and this is a classic called the burning embers diagram. It's a classic diagram from the IPCC. And it's supposed to tell us that actually for small amounts of warming, if you look at between 0 and 1 degrees on the right hand side, you've got whites and yellows and, you know, the level of risk to, the, to, to these different different systems here is moderate or slight. But then as the temperature goes to 2, 3 degrees, the level of risk is high or very high. And, and those systems are unique and threatened systems. You know, they might be glacier um, systems, they might be ecosystems, they might be coastal ecosystems, um, habitats, biodiversity, extreme weather events is the second bar. Distribution of impacts is a bit cryptic. It means how many people, to what extent it might there be societal instability from some people winning and some people losing. Because as I said, it's Climate change is a bumpy, lumpy process. It doesn't affect everybody quite the same. And the fourth column, global aggregate impact, means overall, what do we think the effect is on global GDP, to the extent that that's a reasonable measure, and large uh, scale singular events on the right-hand side, that's stuff like the, mm, the, the melting of the Greenland's ice sheet and what might happen with the North Atlantic circulation or the Amazon forest suddenly becoming a net source, not a net sink of carbon. Um, massive, massive uh, planetary scale, singular meaning irreversible events that could, that could happen. Really Hollywood scary stuff. Um, so bringing all that back home to the UK, uh, here that there's a, the UK government produces some really quite interesting climate projections um, and here are some of the most recent projections for 2061 the, the period 2061 to 2080 it has to be said for for what is a slightly high emission scenario so hopefully things won't actually turn out like this but if i zoom in and we just look at what we're predicting <coughs> for winter and summer uh, temperature changes um, and you can see if you're in Scotland, you can see Scotland there, and I, 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 this could be good news. It could be it could be bad news. It's certainly news. It's certainly interesting news that if we just take the middle column, the median estimates uh, is we're looking at a increase in average winter temperatures across uh, the UK landmass of of 3.1 degrees, and again at the bottom in the middle, an average increase across the UK landmass of 4.6 degrees centigrade in the summer. So if you think what, um, and what, you know, if you look at that's 2.8 for, for, for Scotland, uh, 3.7, 3.8 in the summer for Scotland. So if you're, if you're, if you think what average summer temperatures are on the landmass in Scotland, I, I haven't computed them, but they would be, somewhere around this is day and night temperatures put together so you, you you're probably looking at something like 15 15 degrees and you add to the average 4.6 degrees to get 19.6 that's a that is a huge uh, change in average uh, temperatures and you wouldn't be surprised then to note it note that um, the models could go on and tell you what the change in wind speeds might be what the change in precipitation might be the flooding risk um the the risk of fire there you know it the, these this is just the beginning of the story but it's it's really really significant and this is why the government in the uk has set itself the green dotted line set itself the now net zero target coming down from the red line which was our previous 80% target we want to show the rest of the developed world that 
you can have a thriving economy that doesn't have to be associated with emitting millions of tons of CO2 and other gases. And I think we, we're to applaud ourselves in, in doing it. And the outturn, the black line here is showing that actually, since the IPCC was formed, which is just about just before 1990 there, it was over 800 million tonnes. We're, we're now 500 million tonnes. It, it's an amazing, amazing set of um, successes or coincidences. You know, we've, we've lost a lot of industry, we've shifted from coal to gas, but it is the effect of policy as well being picked up there in that black line. So we're on our way. Um, the government, the UK government has a series of carbon budgets which are shown as a grey staircase in this image and um, we're legally obliged to stay within those that they, the, the profile of that staircase and at the moment uh, we are certainly achieving that um, and doing that and the IAS here is aviation and shipping whether that's factored in or not, and whether you get the net carbon account, that's what that is. But we need to be heading down that staircase uh, towards 2050. Um, we've still got a very, <laughs> and it's a bit like um, low hanging fruits on a tree. You know, if we can, we can, we can, you know, we can, we can deindustrialize a certain extent. We can shift from coal to gas, so we get a big whack, and we can get well on our way. But it get it, it gets increasingly harder. Actually, it's not. It's not necessarily going to be as easy to keep up that momentum. If we look at the contribution of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland to this story, that's shown in this chart here. Uh, and I suppose the big story here is, and in the context of today's webinar, is that Scotland uh, has been doing incredibly well in reducing its emissions from, well, up in 2000, up to 75 million tonnes now down to 40, nearly halved it in that period. Uh, whereas Northern Ireland and Wales are showing smaller reductions. So here we zoom in on Scotland and see well, what's happened in Scotland. Um, and you can see over that period that um, if you look on the left hand side and look at the red line, the crashing of the red line, that's power and that's the power sector decarbonising and all that lovely renewable energy coming on stream um it's just an amazing story and scotland is to be congratulated on that and some progress in the other sectors there you can see waste and agriculture and buildings and industrial gases uh, industry shipping hardly notice surface transport and aviation so they're, they're the two problems you've got actually um, in that period in 2012 to 2017 um all of Scottish policy or UK policy not really making a dent. In fact, the opposite, surface transport emissions up in Scotland, aviation up in Scotland. Um, and obviously these are things which will have to be addressed to get to net zero. This is my last slide. I think you'll all be relieved to hear and my monotonous voice. Um, I, I mean, it's amazing to see this is from August 2019, and there's been a lot of activity in Scotland this year on the policy front. The announcement that Scotland will go net zero by 2045, you've got the um, ban on internal combustion engines in 2032. Actually, Scotland appears to be extremely serious in backing up its promises with, um, I mean, here are a list of 12 actions. Um, which show some some details of how um, Scotland is planning to, to to move down that staircase because it, it uh, it's not simple or easy but it can be done and it, here you know we've got we've we've got everything from from um, we've got number two uh, diet uh, agricultural funds in number three um, green city new deals in number five. Um, Seven is carbon capture and storage CCS. Well, that's a that's um that's a potentially useful technology, but you know hasn't particularly been demonstrated on a large scale at all yet. And whether or not that's possible is is a question. But building standards, Scottish heat pump scheme number ten, um, more renewable energy number eleven, and um, and to redirect. To redirect the bank um, and, and, and make that a bit more serious in number 12. So I think Scotland's be absolutely congratulated for its leadership in climate change and um, 
Well, there you go. That's uh, a quick introduction to climate change from soup to nuts, from molecular uh, pictures of molecules to pictures of uh, government 12 point plans. I hope that has been uh, of interest to you listening. And I think um, if I hand over back to Scott now. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, some great content in there and certainly a lot to digest. Um, so I hope you all found that as interesting and insightful as I did. Um, yeah, although my kind of background's in this field, I still find it astounding not only how our understanding has developed over the past few decades, but also the sheer scale of the problem that kind of lies ahead. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes answering some of the questions that have been sent in uh, during the presentation. Um, and just remember, if you have any kind of burning questions, and you can use that control panel just now uh, to raise these, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, let's see, Stephen, you should be able to see the questions that have been posed there. This is one that is 2050 soon enough. Um, and yeah, the kind of previous targets were kind of net net carbon by 2050. But I guess then the IPCC that you mentioned, they recently released a report that implied we had more tw um, roughly 12 years to make the change. So do you think even with Scotland's target of 2045 and the UK's target of 2050, do you think that's enough? Um, I, I mean, I think I, I think they're very ambitious as they are. Um, um, Extinction Rebellion and other groups are calling for uh, net zero emissions by 2025 or 2030, 35. I mean, it would be great if we could do that. Um, I do think, um, you know, getting to net zero by 2045 or 2050 is already incredibly ambitious. Um, and that's, in my view, um, brilliant if we can achieve that. And it's good to be to, to be setting our goals on that. Um, to to have more ambitious targets would uh, be interesting. It would result in um, us having to disrupt the system in ways which um, potentially, I suppose, depends on what what your view is. But if you if you if you're if you're seeking to disrupt the system and crash the economy uh, completely as one way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that might be quite attractive. But if you if you want to try to uh, have a more of a smooth transition in terms of how we how we generate our income from the types of economic activities that we do while we decarbonize, well then um, more immediate stringent targets might might affect that. So it depends on your point of view whether or not you you value economic stability and to the extent you want that or whether or not you think that the natural environment is too important and we just have to take our place in the system and and we have to suffer and so we can so it's, it's, I think that's a philosophical argument actually but I, I will say that I think 2045 and 2050 are ambitious targets yeah I certainly agree it's kind of if we were to continue down the kind of current line of thinking in terms of economic growth and GDP those things are still achievable and we can still meet these targets, but yeah, there has to be that massive shift. Um, or yeah, like you say, alternatively, yeah, we need to move to a different model. Um, I think there's one here, what does legally obliged mean in practice? And what <laughs> if we do miss this target? So I think that's referring to um, the kind of Paris Agreement and um, yeah. the kind of obligations that were set with that. Well, yeah, legally, actually, countries be penalised if they yes. don't achieve it. Well, actually, there's two there's two levels to legally oblige. Now, in the case of Paris and the UN, I know the answer to that. Um, in the case of that, the UK has set itself legally binding targets. Do you know what? I don't actually know how we would police ourselves if we miss those. I don't actually know that, but I'll I'll explain for the Paris at the level of Paris. Um, there was a compliance regime which was part of the Kyoto Protocol, which survives to this day into the Paris um, Agreement text, which runs to hundreds of pages. And so what happens is if the country uh, fails to meet their 
uh, annual emissions inventory, they go and have a cup of tea with the uh, UN Under Secretary General associated with climate change, and they have a, have their knuckles wrapped. And if they continue to do it, they're going to have a second cup of tea, and um, a third cup of tea will happen. And then the and then a, a third year later will come. Well, maybe we should then put some costs onto your account or some penalties. And, and it's a very gentle compliance mechanism and it's never been tested. So it's all theoretical. And um, so the notion that Kyoto was legally binding or that they wanted Paris to be legally binding, it's all, all very well, it, it sounds very good. But in fact, it, there are no cases uh, where this has been prosecuted in the international courts and the international environmental court. It's, it's all in theory and it's mostly done by um, goodwill and cajoling and cups of tea. Um, that's the answer there. But, but that question does make me think that when everybody proudly says, here's the Climate Change Act 2008 and it's legally binding, I actually don't know what the penalties are or who gets the bet. I, I just, that's a very good question and, I, and I, <laughs> I'll have to go away and look that up. Yeah, it's quite odd when you're kind of talking about penalties. You'd think when you showed the graph earlier, when it's got the kind of different areas of the world, kind of China, India, EU, etc. And when you look at kind of Europe and America, and it's fairly stable in terms of their emissions. Um, it's like when you look at the kind of world that we have just now and how we're kind of we hold countries to account by introducing sanctions and stuff. Do you think that could be a potential mechanism in the future for countries that don't adhere to certain targets? I guess it's quite hard to determine what a suitable approach is. Well, for a very long time, uh, throughout the history of our negotiations, um, people have been suggesting that trade and climate should be linked together. Um, and uh, that's been resisted in policy circles for a long time because trade is complicated enough without linking it to climate which is equally complicated so um you know the world trade or the, the idea that there should be at some point in the future a link between the climate change regime and the world trade organization has been talked about for quite some time and it probably is logical some 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 more beefed up trade negotiations uh, which um you know where we're not just looking at I and mean, we already in trade negotiations we will look at particular aspects of the quality of a product or service and the different ethical standards etc different standards that people are prepared to uh, accept imports or exports of um, but environmental credentials can be one and are one aspect of that and climate credentials can be one aspect of that mm. um i think one of the other problems with that is that the intergovernmental system is um, missing a high level world environment organization um, we don't have that single we, we have the each of the conventions but we don't have a world environment organization which is powerful enough to deal with the world trade organization and there's a bit of a gap in the global uh, legal situation around the international court of justice so there is you know there's uh, there's definitely got to be it's definitely got to be a lot of work in that area in the future if we are going to go to net zero industrial economies followed by net zero rapidly developing economies economies followed by what are now developing economies but hopefully they'll get to net zero too one day we, we we're going to have to talk a lot and argue a lot okay let's think we've just got another couple here um huh, interesting one how how do we ensure that climate change mitigation doesn't increase inequality Mm, gosh well um we have to make sure that that happens both in a uk context but also in a global context in the uk people who spend a greater proportion of their money on heating are, are poorer that they're the, the the those people in energy poverty tend to be poor and they spend a more of their disposable income on heating and so if we come along and apply carbon taxes and and just say yeah everything should be a bit more expensive and we should all be a bit wiser and potentially they are hurt and that's a regressive tax so but people like home energy scotland and others are um doing their careful best to try to target policies and interventions which will try not to in introduce inequality as we try to save energy uh, but on a, on a global 
level. I was asked about this by some sixth formers yesterday, actually. Um, we were discussing the merits of a global carbon tax and they said, well, it, it sort of, it makes sense. But what about those poor people in developing countries that that actually use? So, for example, um, one billion people, one billion people in the world out of 7.8 billion still don't have access to mains electricity. So they either have no electricity or they use diesel generators. Two and a half billion, as we speak, two and a half billion out of 7.8 billion cook on open stoves using wood and cattle dung, which is very bad for their lungs, their eyes, and all sorts of other things. And um, we've got another two billion people, largely in the developing world, who are going to be joining us shortly by 2050. So we have got a lot of people who are already underserved. They don't use enough commercial energy as it is, either electricity or clean burning. So yes, if we come along with a an ill thought out global carbon tax that puts up the price of fossil fuels in developing countries, that's just put up the price of their electricity through their small diesel generator sets, et cetera. And I, and I, and I think the answer is we have to uh, implement serious, uh, we have to have a global carbon tax of somewhere between $100 a ton of CO2 rising to $500 a ton of CO2. We have to implement that now and we have to have not be scared of those potentially regressive problems to do with disparities in income, but we have to have cleverly designed policies to compensate, to compensate those people in those countries that are going to suffer. But we need to wean them off these really dirty fuels. Now, somewhere between 100 or 500 dollars per ton of CO2 tax is going to generate three trillion dollars a year in carbon taxes, which can be spent on energy efficiency, renewable energy, and forestry. Um, you know, that's about double what we spend on all energy, upstream, downstream technologies, or about double the annual defense expenditure. But we are at the point now where, um, you know, if we think if we think spending, you know, 1.7 trillion globally on arming ourselves so that we can destroy our neighbor is a sensible and safe way of mitigating risk. Very shortly, very shortly, we've all we will all wake up and the, the students striking on a Friday the Extinction Rebellion movement, they're all showing us gently and are showing us that actually soon we're going to wake up one morning and when we say to each other, should we spend the same amount that we're spending on global defence expenditure on energy mitigation and helping those that really need it, that's going to seem as sensible as investing in uh, nuclear warfare deterrence. Um, but at the moment it doesn't feel like that, but that day is on its way, you mark my words. So yes, good question. Hmm. We've got to get some. We've got to get. We've got to get some courage here, and, uh, and do it. And the young and the young people are showing the way. Yep. Yeah. It's amazing just being at some of these climate protests, some of the talks, what people have to say, and how motivated they are. And especially in Scotland, kind of you see the kind of potential that there is, kind of announcement that there's going to be this green investment bank, potential to kind of set up a public energy company. And the Scottish government's kind of very focused on bringing people out of fuel poverty. So there's a real opportunity there um, when you get involved and kind of vertically integrate into the energy industry um, that, yes, you can increase taxes on certain fuels and then that money can go into this green investment bank that can then be spent on projects to kind of bring people out of fuel poverty, increase the energy efficiency of their properties. So it's there's a lot of potential. And um, Yes, it is an excite. It's a terrifying and exciting time to kind of mm. be working in this industry. I agree. Um, <laughs> yes, very terrifying. Um, fortunately, I think that's all we've got time for just now. Um, yeah, time is limited. Um, just want to thank everyone for their questions. Uh, apologies, we couldn't answer them all today. Um, but we'll aim to address any unanswered questions by email over the coming days. Um, if you like what you've heard today, then you can tune into our next webinar, which will outline some of the solutions you can adopt to reduce the, your kind of contribution to the climate change problem we face. Um, alternatively, you can call Home Energy Scotland using the number there at the bottom of the screen, uh, and you'll be able to obtain kind of free and partial advice from one of our energy advisors um, on topics from energy efficiency, uh, renewables, low carbon transport, uh, waste and water reduction. Um, Sorry, waste reduction, water efficiency. Um, but yeah, I guess all that's left to say is, well, thank you for joining the webinar today and 
a special thanks to you, Stephen, uh, for finding the time to support us. So, yeah, your your knowledge is incredibly valuable, and yeah, your time's greatly appreciated. So, thank you. Well, th thank you to you, and for everyone who joined, I really appreciate your time. It was good to do it. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.